Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Regatum Institute, uh, which, for those of you who uh, remain unenlightened uh, on this question, is part of the Regatum Group, which is domiciled and headquartered in <coughs> Dubai, and is an international organization with its uh, financial funds established in Dubai, and also with a very wide range of organizations affiliated to it, such as, for example, the Freedom Fund, recently established, which takes the fight against slavery uh, in its modern form, human trafficking, uh, to uh, a global effect. And also, of course, the work of the Legatum Institute itself, which is, in a way, a think tank. But a think tank with an international range of interests and a concern for the interdisciplinary way in which different disciplines come together in order to support the causes of individual human freedom, prosperity, and liberty. Now, in the last four years since Legatum, Legatum Institute really got going, uh, we have established something of a reputation through the annual publication of our Prosperity Index for breadth of interests and depth of understanding, uh, width of culture and uh, depth of scholarship. Nonetheless, uh, hardly any of us can hold a candle to our very distinguished guest this evening, so far as breadth and width is concerned. Rowan Williams, known to the public world as Lord Williams of Oystermouth, of course, uh, but to uh, all his friends and acquaintances for some decades as just Rowan, uh, has been uh, an adornment of uh, Ecclesia Anglicana for, for some years. He would have adorned uh, the, uh, the Church of England at any time, indeed, in its illustrious <coughs> history since, uh, since the 6th century. Uh, but he did, of course, have his starter archbishopric before he was translated uh, to Lambeth. And uh, Ecclesia Walia, as we all know, is even older than Ecclesia Anglicana. <laughs> so having got his starter archbishopric out of the way, uh, he was then raised to great eminence. But the true eminence that is Rowan's is not a question of uh, the hierarchical dignities of church and state. It's uh, really a question of scholarship and learning and his ability with the natural and unadorned eloquence of the Welshman to communicate these things to a, a wide and delighted audience. He made his reputation uh, as a young man uh, to magisterial effect, really, uh, astonishingly so, with a range of his publications on the history of the early church. But his has never been uh, an intelligence that is content with just mastering one discipline or even just one recondite language. Uh, he, he spans the disciplines and he leaps from one vertiginous uh, cultural height to another with the agility and the finesse of a Welsh mountain goat. <laughs> and this really is why I was so very delighted when uh, Rowan said a few months ago that he'd be very happy to come along and give this final talk in the series of lectures that we've been uh, holding here, the Guatemala Institute, uh, during these winter months, on the world in 1913-14, uh, the cultural world of 1913-14. Uh, and uh, these are the issues that we've been looking at uh, through the prism of individual biographies. We started with Vernon Bogdano talking about Sir Edward Gray, the Foreign Secretary, in that fateful last year of peace. And uh, we went on to talk about Coco Chanel, uh, the great entrepreneur. And uh, entrepreneurialism is something that we're rather keen on in this institute. We even have a, uh, an institute uh, foundation at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the Legatum Fund uh, has endowed in order to study the means by which entrepreneurs <coughs> change the world. Well, Coco Chanel certainly changed the world. And uh, in the course of uh, addressing as on that evening, Justine Picardy, the distinguished biographer of Coco, uh, managed to convince us of uh, Coco's <coughs> enduring place 
in the pantheon of values. And so to the rather different kind of character that we're going to be talking about, and that Rowan is going to be talking about this evening. Uh, von Harnack was, by any standards, one of the very greatest scholars produced by a culture, a country, uh, always notable for its zeal and respect for scholarship and originality of thought. But he grew to greatness at a time in German history when its culture was becoming very unstable and its politics was becoming even more unstable than that of the rest of contemporary Europe. Von Harnack occupies uh, a unique place in the history of Christian scholarship, and he also occupies a very important place in the history of German culture in these last years of peace. But as Rowan will go on to tell us, he carried on living for a rather long time after that, and carried on being very important to Germany and to Europe. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's with very great pleasure that I introduce to the Legatum Institute, Rowan Williams. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Harold, and thank you for the opportunity to explore this remarkable personality a little with you this evening. On August the 4th, 1914, the day on which war was declared between England and Germany, Kaiser Wilhelm II assembled the members of the Reichstag for an extraordinary meeting. He spoke briefly, but very eloquently on that occasion, essentially about Germany's moral case for going to war. He speaks about the self-defense of Germany. He speaks about the need to defend the place in which God has put us, a phrase which resonates, I think, in many ways, in the understanding of what was going on at that time. Den Platz zu bewahren, auf den Gott uns gestellt hat. He speaks of the need to resist the unersättliche Nationalismus of Russia, the insatiable nationalism of Russia, and claims that his government has never had anything in mind as a goal except to develop the ethical, spiritual, and economic strength of its people. A moral case for the war. A moral case which does not seem to have come absolutely naturally to the lips of the Kaiser. We know from other sources just what a level of mental confusion he was experiencing at the time, and emotional confusion. But this speech and the speech which he'd given a little while before from the balcony of the Royal Palace in Berlin, both set out a vision of Germany's God-given role in Europe, the need to defend it against the barbarism especially of the Slavs, and to a lesser extent the barbarism of the French, but that's another story. And it presupposes a particular kind of ethical and religious mindset, which is what I want to try to explore a little with you this evening. The speech from the throne in the Reichstag was drafted in part by Karl Gustav Adolf von Harnack. At that time, the director of the Royal Library in Berlin, one of the founders of the Kaiser Wilhelm Gesellschaft, most important academic and cultural association, a man whose distinction as a church historian and New Testament scholar and philologist was unparalleled not only in Germany, but in the whole of Europe. Harnack, recently ennobled, stood for the supreme achievement of German culture, it might be said. And it wasn't entirely surprising that he should be drafted in to help the Kaiser and the nation at this particular point. In September 1914, Harnack and some of his theological colleagues issued an appeal to Protestant Christians in Europe, once again underlining the need for peace, the need to avoid misrepresenting Germany, the need for Germany to defend its historic and God-given role. And most famously or notoriously of all, in the following month, on October the 23rd, 
Harnack was one of 93 <coughs> signatories to an open letter to the cultivated world of Europe, the so-called Manifesta Intellectuelle, the Intellectuals Manifesto, which attempted to counter reports of German atrocities in Belgium and which once again insisted on Germany's right to self-defense, Germany's God-given vocation to defend Europe against Asiatic barbarism. There's quite a lot about Slavs and Asiatics in that also. And Germany's constant role as victim in European history over many centuries. The tenor of that document is not unlike that of some other documents um, dealing with alleged atrocities. It's the threefold argument, nothing actually happened, it has been much exaggerated, and in any case they started it. <laughs> but it's an eloquent, forceful, and you could say unrestrained document. Its reception was, as you can imagine, not particularly friendly. But that's another story. In the years that followed, Many of the things happened which happen when open letters and manifestos are issued. Some of the signatories claimed they'd never actually read it. Some of them withdrew their support, including, of course, the great mathematical physicist, physicist Max Planck, who very shortly after the publication of the letter distanced himself from it. And there was a great deal of confusion, as there so often is, about what exactly had gone into the making of the document. But. It's very significant that, once again, Harnack's name was one of those most instantly noticed by the learned and cultured world throughout Europe and also by the Christian world within Germany. As we'll see later on, it was Harnack's subscription to this letter which alienated a whole generation of younger theologians and produced some very unexpected and rather dramatic results in the intellectual history of 20th century Germany. More of that anon. But now a little more about Harnack himself. His background as a scholar I've already touched on. He was the author of a multi-volume history of Christian dogma, the author of innumerable monographs on aspects of the Greek New Testament and the early church, of a groundbreaking work on Marcion, the second century heretic, and perhaps most significantly for our purposes, the author of a little book called The Essence of Christianity, based on open lectures which he delivered in Berlin in 1899 and 1900. 16 lectures devoted to the defense of Christianity against its despisers. <coughs> I put it like that because he was quite deliberately echoing the work 100 years before of Friedrich Schleiermacher in Berlin, who lectured on religion to its cultured despisers. Harnack is quite deliberately reviving a genre, a style of apologetic and religious discussion in the public sphere for which the ground was cleared in the previous century. But to understand what he's doing in those open lectures, we need to think just a little about his specific intellectual background. As one of his greatest critics, Karl Barth, pointed out, Harnack almost leaps back to the 18th, not only the early 19th century, in his scholarly approach to the church. In the 18th century, one of the greatest of church historians in that era, Mosheim, had produced a formidable series of texts about the formation of early Christian doctrine, in which he'd argued very passionately that the problem with early Christian doctrine was its infection by philosophy. The Reformation is all about purging Christianity from philosophy so that you don't commit yourself to any doctrinal statements. And you can turn to the inner world, the inner life. Mosheim, who interestingly enough translated Rafe Cudworth, the Cambridge Platonist, the 19th century Cambridge Platonist, was somebody who was both obsessed by and profoundly hostile to Platonism. And his version of the story of the early church is that of a rake's progress, a church which fatally flirts with its intellectual and cultural context and is finally absorbed into that cultural context 
and ceases to be what it ought to be. Harnack retrieves exactly that story. And once again, his massive history of dogma is a prolonged Rake's progress story. <coughs> to return to the sources is a matter of purging out that extraneous philosophical and, he's, as he says, speculative dimension from Christian language. And the great lectures of 1899 to 1900 set out to do precisely that. The essence of Christianity, the wesen of Christianity, is something internal, a set of moral dispositions, not a set of doctrines, let alone a set of practices. And this is what he sets out to elaborate in the lectures. <coughs> The printed version of the lectures, edited from transcripts of his spoken delivery, proved hugely popular. They were still being reprinted in the 1920s. I have here the 25th anniversary edition of Das Wesen des Christentums, proudly announcing on its title page, 70th thousand. thousand. It sold probably in the region of 100,000 copies during its primary reading life. And it was translated into practically every European language. Once again, in his introduction here, <coughs> Harnack notes with becoming modesty that it has just appeared in Finnish and Estonian. But Harnack begins these lectures by saying that he is not attempting in one sense, to define the essence of Christianity as a timeless intellectual conceptual framework. He is undertaking a purely and simply historical task. He is, after all, a historian, not a philosopher. So what he proposes to do for us is to tell us what Jesus said, and then to tell us what Jesus must have meant, and then to tell us what we are to do about it. It's apologetic by refusing to do apologetic, in a sense. It's saying, I'm simply going to tell you what actually happened, and you must make up your own minds. So he says he's not going to talk about what religion is in general. That has no interest for him. He's going to talk about what particular kind of religiousness the event of Jesus made possible. And once we grasp that very specific historical truth, then we're in a position to make up our minds about Christian faith as we would not otherwise be. It is interesting that in his introduction to the 1925 edition, Harnack says that one of the things that has disturbed him in the intellectual climate of the post-war period is that people are more and more interested in the question, what is religion in general? And he says he is still himself obstinately not interested in that, because he doesn't believe that that has any particular value for the Christian church. So he retains that reserve about what he regards as indefensible generalities and retains his commitment to what he regards as the simple question of what Jesus actually said and did. And if in the title of this talk I've referred to deadly simplicity, you may in a while see exactly why that might be one way of looking at Harnack. So what did Jesus really teach? He taught the fatherhood of God, the infinite value of the individual soul, and the higher righteousness. Those are the three primary building blocks of Harnack's Jesus' Christianity. Christianity is a moral influence in the heart. And when Jesus speaks in the Gospels about the kingdom of God, that is what he means. An inner transformation, dependent on the recognition that God regards you as a son or daughter, depending on the recognition that the dignity of the individual is the supreme non-negotiable value in the human world, dependent on the idea that righteousness comes from inner transformation rather than either ritualism or moralism. And Harnack very 
carefully situates himself between those two extremes. Religion can't be about ritualism. It can't be about external activities and satisfying external demands. But neither can it just be a system of moral instruction. There has to be, and here Harnack um, shamelessly steals Nietzsche's clothes, there has to be what he calls a transvaluation of values. We have to learn to see differently. And in the light of our different seeing, our love is shown in service, in unselfishness, in care for the needy and the poor, and in stout resistance to any attempts to draw us back into ritualism or moralism. At the heart of the lectures, both literally and substantively, the fifth to the seventh of the lectures deal with a series of very specific questions that Harnack sees coming out of this overall approach. They're questions about the gospel of Jesus and asceticism, the gospel of Jesus and the poor, the gospel and law in society, the gospel and culture, the gospel and the doctrines of Christ, and the gospel and the creed in general. He's very clear that the teaching of Jesus has social implications. That's to say, you cannot claim to be a follower of Jesus, transformed inwardly into the higher righteousness by Jesus, unless you have a deep personal concern for the well-being of the poor. And some of the passages in that particular section of these lectures about our understanding of what is owed to the poor might at first blush come from the writings of an English Christian socialist of the late 19th century. Until you read on and read Harnack's absolutely unambiguous refusal to contemplate any legislative reinforcement of this attitude. There can be no social program associated with the gospel. There are only social attitudes. There can be no corrective legislation. And it's quite clear that Harnack here has in mind, indeed precisely, Christian socialism, whether in England or in Germany of the period. The Jesus that Harnack envisages is certainly not a Jesus who is uninterested in the social world he inhabits, not someone who is above the <coughs> complexities of human suffering, including economic suffering. Equally, this is a Jesus who is not hostile to what we might now call wealth creation. There is an interesting and eloquent passage in which Harnack spells out very carefully the fact, as he sees it, that Jesus has nothing to say about the actual processes of the acquisition of wealth or the goodness or badness of rich people. The point is always internal. It is the transformation, the transvaluation of our attitudes. And the goal for all this is what Harnack refers to in a rather moving little phrase as the transformation of society into a Volk von Brüdern a people of brothers. The presence of the transformed Christian consciousness in society is part of a slow leavening process which will make society itself a kind of organic familial reality. More of that in a moment. Now, this of course immediately raises some quite complicated questions about the Christian's attitude to politics and the public order. Harnack's background is Lutheran, North German Lutheran. And therefore his Jesus is unambiguously on the side of obedience to lawfully constituted authority. There's a telling phrase in the sixth lecture where he quotes another theologian of the period, Wellhausen, on the subject of Jesus' apparent prohibition in the Gospels of taking oaths. Some of you will recall that Tolstoy had some very strong views about this and took it absolutely au pied de la lettre. 
Wellhausen says that nobody with the least grain of sense could believe that Jesus was forbidding you to take an oath in front of a magistrate. It's perfectly clear that that cannot be what Jesus meant. So there is at work in Harnack's reading of his Jesus, a very clear assumption that there are some things Jesus cannot be saying, cannot be meaning. And so when Jesus speaks in the gospel about non-resistance, about turning the other cheek, it is crystal clear that this is a private matter. This is how you behave in your family, he says. This is how you behave among your friends and your colleagues. Non-resistance, unselfishness, the yielding up of your own position is something you must develop as an individual because Jesus always and only addresses the individual in one of his um, most resonant phrases. Jesus always and only addresses the individual. And Harnack suggests that Jesus is so confident in the triumph of law and justice that he never feels the need to consider <coughs> that justice will need force to back it up. Jesus is so much of a political idealist, you may say, that he never raises the question of whether the commands of government need to be enforced and what our attitude ought to be to that force. A violent state, and Harnack is clear about this, a violent state is an offence against justice. But legitimate force, the requirement of obedience to the law in all its aspects, the requirement therefore also, in the words of the 39 articles, to bear arms at the commandment of the magistrate, all this must be part of what Jesus would have taken for granted had he thought about it. Behind it is what Harnack states with passion rather more than clarity at one important point in the argument. There is a complete opposition between the world of spirit and flesh, between the world of ethics and the world of physics, as he puts it. And whether you call it ethics versus physics, or God versus the world, or spirit versus flesh, the same thing is going on. We live in the heart of an irresoluble tension between the demands of the society we live in, with its resort to force, and the demand for inner transformation. We cannot dissolve that tension coming down simply on one side or the other. We cannot be totally uncritical about the state, but neither do we have any right to say that there is a Christian duty to resist. <coughs> only one thing matters. Only one relationship matters. Only one imperative matters, he says, and that is to be God's child, to be a citizen of the kingdom, to live in love. His passage on the tension, the dualism, that he sees in human life is, as I've hinted, one of the least lucid passages in what is generally a beautifully lucid exposition. It's a point at which, had he not been so allergic to philosophical speculation, he might perhaps have found a few helpful allies in the intellectual history of the 19th century. But that, again, is another story. Suffice it to say that he did not like Hegel. But this allows him to suggest not only that the church is not equipped or not licensed to intervene in public and political life, it also allows him a very sharp criticism of political parties. And that's quite significant in thinking about the years leading up to 1914 as well. A politicized church, and he's quite clearly thinking of the Catholic Church in Germany in the days of the Kulturkampf, and a political party are equally abominations. 
Yeah, equally, he says, unberufen. Now, that is sometimes translated as unconstitutional or not legitimately constituted. But I think we need to hear the full resonance of the German word, which carries within it echoes of words that have to do with vocation. There is no <coughs> transcendental legitimizing of the political church or the political party. What is legitimate is the state and its governance. And that implies, though Harnack never quite says this in so many words, implies precisely the kind of model of national and state identity which the Kaiser defended from the balcony of the palace and in front of the Reichstag in August 1914, where in effect, he says, the days of party conflict are over. I now put myself before you, not as a representative of any party or interest in the state, but as the representative of this state and this nation. And for the duration of the conflict, we must, we can and we must forget about partisan identity. That patriarchal, organic view of society is something which clearly had a strong draw for Harnack. And again, it has its roots in precisely that North German Lutheran tradition out of which he came. A tradition which is entirely serious about the imperatives of both the gospel and the law and refuses to offer any premature resolution or reconciliation between them. Unsurprisingly, Harnack quotes Goethe. At some point you know that he is going to quote Goethe, just like every good German intellectual. And the passage he chooses to quote from Goethe is essentially about tensions that can only be lived through and overcome by the living of them. You don't rush to the end, you don't find a formula, a speculative philosophical scheme which can hold this together. You patiently live through the potentially difficult work of being a good citizen in the patriarchal organic state and allowing yourself to be transformed internally. It's in that sense that it's actually quite hard to recognize Harnack as a Democrat, precisely. And there is, I think, more to be said and more to be explored about exactly what his relationship was to ideas of democracy. But it seems to me an, an underrated element in his overall position, this patriarchal sense of a society in which political party conflict the, what you might call the life of the agora or the forum is really not of very great interest, either to the ruler or to the believer. Another area worth exploring, but I mention it only to pass on hastily, is Harnack's relation to Tolstoy. Because of course at the time he was writing these lectures, Tolstoy's work was widely discussed in religious and cultural circles across Europe. And at several points in the lectures, Harnack feels the need to turn sideways, as it were, to address Tolstoy and say, I quite see why you say what you do, but that can't be it. Tolstoy wants a visible, a manifest detachment of the believer and the believing community from the state, its power, and its violence. Harnack says to Tolstoy, as it were, you're absolutely right to see two completely different orders in conflict here. But the conflict is precisely not the conflict between two sorts of institution or two sorts of community. It's a conflict within the human will and can only be resolved in the individual's life. So I hope that some of that gives a little background to why and how, in August 1914, Harnack found himself drafting speeches for the Kaiser of the kind that he did draft and supporting the manifesto of the intellectuals. He is not, let's be clear, an uncritical German nationalist. The point is not that there is something 
mystically superior about being German, that there are one or two passages where he says a little near the wind on that. It is more that here is a legitimate state, a Reichsstaat, which history has endowed with very particular intellectual and spiritual gifts, which has a particular vocation within Europe, a God-given role within Europe, and which has an obligation, therefore, to defend its cultural heritage and to resist all those non-European forces which seek to undermine it. I'll come back in a moment to some of the slightly more ambivalent elements in that. But I think it's important to take seriously the fact that Harnack is not a forerunner of the Third Reich in any intelligible sense whatever. What then has he got to say about actual Christian churches and actual Christian practice? The last cluster of lectures in the series deal in sequence with varieties of Christianity through the ages and at the present day. And once again, we learn a great deal about what Harnack thought of faith in society from looking at what he says about specific churches and their practices. Catholicism is clearly a major problem, as it was a major political problem in the Germany of his day and the Germany of his earlier years even more so. But he is a fair-minded man, and he grants that one of the great things that Catholicism has done is to resist what he calls Staatsomnipotenz, the all-powerfulness of the state. Catholicism at least says there is some area of human life which the state does not control. The mistake, as with Tolstoy, the mistake, as with Tolstoy, is to say that the division between what the state does and doesn't control can, so to speak, be externally marked. The Catholic Church ought to be saying that what the state doesn't control is the inner life, the conscience. What the Catholic Church ends up saying is that what the state doesn't control is this institution called the Catholic Church. And that is precisely how not to do it in Harnack's world. The counter power of the Catholic Church is not the power of the free conscience, with all that that implies about the dignity of the individual. Nonetheless, Catholicism does at least have a principle of resistance to complete totalitarianism, as we would call it. And in that respect, it's preferable to Eastern Orthodoxy. But it's still making a category mistake. What about Eastern Orthodoxy? Harnack actually knew more about Eastern Orthodoxy than probably any German scholar of his generation. He actually learned Russian in order to read monographs on some of the early Christian writers he'd included in his History of Dogma, the only reputable scholarly work at that time on the great Maximus the Confessor, the um, eighth century Byzantine theologian, was by a Russian scholar called Epifonovich, and Harnack dutifully learned Russian and read it, and visited Russia. In Russia, he was impressed by what he saw of peasant piety. He had enough sympathy with Tolstoy to feel, as the Count did, that there was something very remarkable, very moving, and very evangelical in the broadest sense about many aspects of peasant life in Russia. But it didn't have very much to do with the Orthodox Church. Because Eastern Orthodoxy, says Harnack, is natural religion. By which he doesn't mean the religion that comes naturally to human beings, so much as a religion of nature. Orthodoxy is about things that happen. It's about stuff. It's about material transformation. It's about light beaming from the transfigured faces of the saints. It's about kissing relics and smearing yourself with oil. And you can imagine what Harnack thought of all that. <laughs> this is the religion of nature. And he says, if you took Jesus Christ out of Eastern Orthodoxy, you wouldn't notice the difference. <laughs> I said that he knew more about Eastern Orthodoxy than almost anybody else in Western Europe at the time. That is a rather sad reflection of the general level of knowledge of Eastern Orthodoxy, but I digress. But it does help us to see why in his doctrinal histories, Harnack is very skeptical and 
indeed hostile, about a certain style of doctrinal speculation, particularly associated with the Greek world from, say, 300 to 800, in which there's much focus on how the natures of the divine and the human are brought together in the person of Christ or in the sacraments of the church. For Harnack, because this is about natures, it's not about morality. What about Protestantism? Well, says Harnack, it is universally agreed that Protestantism is in a very bad state. It's theologically underequipped, it's communally weak, it's politically compromised. Harnack did not approve of state churches. In spite of his Lutheran heritage, he was very, very uncon deeply unconvinced about the possibility of any kind of political backing for any religious body. So the fact that in 1899-1900, the reality of the state church was the way in which most Germans would experience Protestant Christianity was for Harnack a grievous embarrassment. And yet, he says, in spite of all that, it is the Protestant faith that has allowed millions of Germans, and he as it were, underlines Germans, millions of Germans, to have access to spiritual religion. That is to say, a religion that is free from ritual and dogma and hierarchy. It may be, in a rather compromised and unhelpful way, allied to the forms of a state church, Nonetheless, it is spiritual in a sense which Catholicism and orthodoxy cannot be. So it's worth investing in. And in the 16th and last lecture, he does touch very briefly on the question of the German genius. Is Protestantism a particularly German creation? Well, he doesn't want to commit himself on that. There was, after all, a man called John Calvin. But how interesting that Calvin has never made any impact on the German soul. So he claims. <laughs> Calvinism has only taken root among the English, the Scots, and the Dutch. And no self-respecting German, we are to understand, could really take it seriously in the light of that. <laughs> Luther is a supreme example of the German genius. He is quintessentially a German, a fluent, persuasive, rhetorically enthusiastic and confident German, who uses the language in a new way, who reshapes the imagination of a whole people. And, says Harnack, in another gratuitous sideswipe at neighbours to the east, no Slav has ever done anything like that. So his ideal church, it seems, is the local gathering of morally serious individuals, not backed by legislation, minimally sacramental, there's almost nothing in this book about the life of the sacraments, minimally institutional. There may be pastors, but there are certainly not bishops. A community in which love is cultivated, individual charity is encouraged, and moral perspective is deepened on both your personal and your public duties. The enormous popularity of Harnack's lectures, not only before but after the war, shows what a chord he struck in the German religious imagination, and not only the German. But the problems of his position are not too difficult to tease out. Perhaps we can put it most simply by saying that there's no sense in Harnack of conflicting identities. There may be in your spiritual self, your spiritual will, an awareness of the tension between different sorts of imperatives. But essentially, your identity is that of the citizen of the benign patriarchal state to which you owe loyalty, in whose name you make oaths and may serve in the army. <coughs> That there should be an identity as, let's say, a member of the community of the baptized, an identity which might 
set you apart in some way from the state, that's not there. And there's not even very much sense in Harnack of tension between, let's say, the obligations, the identities, the loyalties that go with family life and the state. In good patriarchal tradition, this is a state where the life of the family and the organic community is always in harmony with the life of the wider political unit. Or to put it in <coughs> other terms, terms which Hegel would well have understood, there is no Creon and Antigone problem on the horizon here. So the freedom of conscience, which is so important for Harnack, remains something which never legitimizes resistance at the external level. It will legitimate mental reservation, semi-detachment, private skepticism, but not a pushing back against the state. Because if what we are working for is a folk von Brüder, a people of brothers, then you cannot pull away from the common task with the costs and the compromises that entails. Harnack would have been rather surprised to be told this, but there are aspects of his thought which are quite remarkably in tune with 17th century Anglicanism, with Lancelot Andrews preaching as he did on Whit Sunday in, I think, 1609, about the evils of Catholicism in terms of the evils of a worldly, political, violence-employing semi-state. That's what's wrong with Catholicism in Andrews's eyes. They chime with the views of later 17th and 18th century Anglicans when they try to define the much misunderstood phrase passive obedience. We owe the state passive obedience, meaning not that we necessarily do what the state orders, but that if we decide not to cooperate with the state, we must accept without protest what the state then does to us. Passive obedience. You recognize the right of the state to punish you, even if you assert your own right not actively to cooperate, passive obedience. But Harnack's misfortune is to be speaking at the beginning of a century in which the ethical standing of the state is about to become more urgent and controversial than ever. Can political authority, existing political authority, actually be criticized or resisted in loyalty to civil society? Can our actual loyalty to civil society, with all that means, the specific moral communities to which we belong, can that provide a ground for actively resisting a state which is indeed asserting a Staatsomnipotenz, the right of the state in every sphere of life? One of the older Harnack's pupils was a young man called Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who found his own answer to that question in a way very, very much at odds with what Harnack had assumed. But Bonhoeffer would, I think, have said if pressed that, that was precisely what he was seeking to define, a loyalty to civil society that was not immediately and exhaustively coterminous with loyalty to the existing political settlement. Bonhoeffer was one of Harnack's favorite students, and Harnack was deeply dismayed when Bonhoeffer began to drift away under the malign influence of people like Karl Barth. But Bonhoeffer, who of course outlived Harnack, saw what Harnack was perhaps beginning to see at the end of his life, but never had the opportunity to confront fully and that is the hypertrophism of the state which appears in the Third Reich. Is the church there not only to cultivate inner dispositions, but to ground or educate civil society in the possibilities of resistance through its own social practice? Again, a question which Harnack consistently wants to avoid or indeed disallow. You could say that he doesn't see the moral tensions in political life as tensions about different kinds of belonging. 
or as I said earlier, different kinds of identity. And yet that is one of the ways in which, very typically, the political stroke ethical problems of the 20th century actually work themselves out. And they are issues still with us. If you think of the continuing and very complex discussion about what it is, let's say, for a Muslim to understand diverse kinds of belonging within a single citizenship. I've mentioned once or twice the reaction of Karl Barth to Harnack. Barth, possibly the greatest Protestant theologian of the 20th century, if not ever, Barth had begun his ministry very much in Harnack's shadow and in Harnack's debt, like almost every other educated theologian in Germany. But it's Barth himself who describes the experience of seeing Harnack's name in the list of subscribers to the Manifesto of the Intellectuals, a moment at which Barth says his entire intellectual and spiritual world dissolved. Barth believed that the events of 1914 were catastrophic, that the role of the Kaiser and the German government was malign, that there was need for public debate and public criticism, not the organic and patriarchal solidarity to which Harnack appealed. And Barth began to rethink the foundations of his theology systematically, with results in the shape of millions of eloquent and exhilarating words familiar to possibly some in the room as the church dogmatics. Bonhoeffer represents a somewhat more subtle, more exploratory reaction to Harnack, and yet the same issues are there. By the end of the 1920s, the political climate in Germany was moving inexorably in a direction which Harnack, in fact, found as uncongenial, as did Barth and Bonhoeffer. The difference was simply that Barth and Bonhoeffer believed they had to look elsewhere for resources to meet this new and toxic Germany, which was coming into being. It's not that well known that Harnack was one of those who drafted the constitution of the Weimar Republic. He attempted, in the post-war period, to do rather more than his lectures actually licensed him to do, that is to move more actively into the public and political sphere and attempt to shape something like a pluralist and democratic society. He battled against the rising tide of anti-Semitism in Germany to his eternal credit. And yet, when he died in 1930, it's hard not to think that he must have looked at his political life's work as profoundly under threat at that moment. But to understand something of what was going on in that heightened, overheated intellectual and spiritual environment of late summer 1914, to understand some of the confusions and the lacunae in public discourse, public thinking. It helps, I believe, to look back at the achievement of this extraordinary, and in the light of later events, tragic figure, who believed in total sincerity that it was indeed possible to define Christianity once and for all in a way that restricted it to the transformation of individuals, took it out of the risky public arena of conflict, debate, and policy formation, and preserved it safe for those whom Hegel would have called beautiful souls. Harnack is a giant among European intellectuals. That he is a flawed giant is perhaps to say no more than we would have to say about most intellectual giants in European history. But if we want to see something of the moral force, the moral perspective 
which animated those who wanted, in the late summer of 1914, to defend the morality of Germany's response. Harnack is no bad place to start. The lectures on the essence of Christianity remain wonderful reading. They are vivid, often personal, pictorially clear, written in or delivered in a wonderfully elegant conversational German, which is a delight to read <coughs> and is not very well captured, I think, by some of the English translations. They reflect a man who believed with all his heart that it was right for a theologian to be a public intellectual, but that the way in which a theologian was most appropriately a public intellectual was by the theologian carefully demarcating what the public and the private were about and privileging the private. It's not an ignoble task or vision that it didn't exactly work in the light of the 20th century, not least the 20th century in German, Germany, is not entirely Harnack's fault. But he leaves us with some profoundly interesting questions, not only about 100 years ago, but about Britain and Europe today. Thank you.